everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today, we have Camille McKenzie, CEO and co-founder of Kintail, a no-code analytics platform that enables construction firms to integrate and automate data from any source and build insights in minutes without the need for writing code or spending hours in spreadsheets. Camille, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to chat with you as we were discussing before the show. Construction tech is so fascinating because, you know, it's a lot of companies are disrupting the industry and, and really making uh, uh, the whole process of building more efficient and more effective. And I think, you know, as, as, as people in our day-to-day -day lives, um, we will be directly influenced by, you know, the success of your company and other companies alike. But before we get into all that good stuff, what were you doing before you started Kintail? Yeah, that's actually a great question. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it um, and very excited to be here. Um, and yeah, so before starting Kintail, um, I was actually a serial founder of several design-focused companies. Um, I was actually the principal designer and owner of a custom residential interior studio and had the great privilege of working with some of the most accomplished and well-known architects in the Southeast and just the U.S. at large, which was very cool. Um, and then more recently, I had actually founded a graphic design studio where we were crafting very compelling uh, brand experiences for fellow creatives and designers. Yeah. So I am everything like uh, background oriented in terms of design, um, have been in, in and around the construction industry yeah. for most of my adult life. So it's, it's been very interesting background. <laughs> no, that's amazing. I, I, setting, I think from, you know, talking to people who come from a design perspective, because they have such an insight into what people are attracted to or, or what is actually functional as well as beautiful, um, you know, based on your background experience, working with architects, uh, what are some really cool, you know, projects you've been a part of and, and what are some other projects that, um, that maybe missed in, in a certain area and in what area w was that? It was, it was a functionality, was it usability, was it, um, you know, anything, anything under the sun yet. So curious about, you know, your experience as a designer and, and from the design side. Yeah. Um, I love to share. I am a designer at heart. I've always been incredibly creative. I was, um, yeah. I actually was in music for a very long time and it started college as a music education major. Um, and so design was kind of just a natural output of that. Mm -hmm. um, and really I had, um, we attended Techstars this last year for what Kintel is doing. And actually our managing director at the time said, you know, Camille, nobody loves construction. Um, and I actually had to laugh at that because while that may be true for many people, it's not actually true for me. Um, I actually love the whole construction process. Um, I really love getting to see a design of what someone has created and it's all on paper. Um, you know, you've only get, just got like an inkling of what that's truly going to look like. And then really getting into the process and seeing all this craftsmanship come into it with construction companies coming in and building out, you know, just amazing architectural designs in terms of like commercial buildings and bridges, even down to homes. It's just amazing what you can create. Um, and so for me, it was really thrilling getting to work with some of these top architects. Um, mm -hmm. I work with the likes of like Jeffrey Dungren, Dungan, um, Lewis Niquette, Bill Ingram, um, been in the homes of like uh, Bobby McAlpine. These are some of the top architects coming out of the Southeast and have been for quite some time and are very influential across the rest of the yeah. country and um, have won many awards. Um, and it's just really interesting getting to see that. Um, I'd really say some of those projects were just some of the most um, just incredible getting to go into a lot of the homes um, that I worked on was so much fun. They just put so much part in detail into what they mm -hmm. do. And it really shows um, just in comparison to walking through like a builder grade home and then getting to go into like a custom designed yeah. just for you space is, is just really a thing to see. You really have to be able to experience it and be in this space to just like get the awe behind it. Um, yeah. But it's very cool. Um, I actually spent a lot of time working on a commercial um, project as well. I helped do a lot of drafting and um, material design work for, um, there's a series of hospitals that are located in the Southeast that um, previously were known as Health South as, as the company, but they've actually since transitioned into something else. And with that, that was a little bit harder to get into is the commercial side, only because the, like the functionality is there, you got to build the space for the public, but it's, it lacks like that, to me, that real aspect of creativity and that uniqueness that you get in residential design. And um, that just really like that has been much more inspirational to me on that side. So 
commercial, yeah. not so much my forte, didn't love that as much, but um, it's always interesting to see what people are putting out there on that side of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so fascinating. You know, I, I feel like every time I go out to a building and I, I'm a sucker for like a, a good Netflix or, or even YouTube video about a beautiful mm -hmm. home that's built super custom into yeah. the landscape. Um, how do you consider or how, how, you know, what goes in the process to really elicit emotion and, and, um, experience from, you know, building, I think a lot of us maybe think it might be easy. I think everyone's kind of a pseudo expert in interior design, but don't necessarily, you know, but are, are limited by, you know, the space, but how do architects and designers maximize and also, you know, create kind of an experience through a physical space? It seems like, I don't, it, it seems so abstract to me. Um, you um, know, as, as someone who doesn't work within it, but I'm curious from your perspective is what goes into the process to, to take certain things, um, elements and, and create a, a physical space that gives somebody an emotion or experience. Yeah, that's actually a great question. And so often that is very true. I know everybody loves to play amateur designer. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, definitely something that is not limited to what your role is in life. Um, anybody can design, you know, space for themselves and have it be something very special um, and specific to them. Um, but when it comes to interior design, like often we get this idea that it's this very glamorous job, um, but there's like really so much hard work that goes into it that I never realized before I got into the profession, um, how much like drafting is involved in that, mapping out floor plans, space planning, um, really having an understanding and good um, concept about design in general in terms of like proportion and scale, um, understanding how color plays into that texture, like what you're really kind of creating when it comes to that, that it's more so than just aesthetics. It's that feeling that's very hard to capture, um, which is why it's so often like misunderstood, I think, for design, you think you could just so easily just slap some things together and have it create that thing you're talking yeah. about, which is really that environment. Um, and really so much of that comes from just a deep study into who you're designing for, trying to understand like how they think about the space, what it yeah. means to them for either their home or like what you're trying to create at your company in a building and really just having like a good grasp of what that means and then utilizing things in a way that most people don't think about. Um, in order to create that environment, um, using color, using texture, using like details in yeah. what the design is that you're doing through materials on the wall or the flooring or how lighting plays into that, how natural light comes in through windows and how that affects space during the daytime versus lighting at night. And it's really like so many different small little things that when they add up, create that really special effect that it's, once you get talked to by an interior designer of what they did for their space. It's amazing the things that you didn't even notice that one element tied into another thing over here. And it's all just these little things at the end of the day, when they explain and walk you through the design, it's like, you can really start seeing how much detail and thought went into a space, which is always just what was just incredibly astounding to me and why I'm so attracted to construction and just design in general. It's just the constant creation of something that yeah. didn't previously exist and it's yeah. there for like i mean in some cases centuries uh it's just amazing to see yeah i i always get so fascinated you know how uh, some things just have such a legacy once they're built in a certain way or in a certain fashion a certain style i lived in you know san francisco and new york and both have a lot of historical um you know buildings and and and, and still a functional to the purpose that they were built to or built for at the time today and uh -huh. it's so beautiful how um the environment really really has so many elements taking place I, I love how you yeah that word is so so perfect because there are so many elements um even mm -hmm. both you know uh, within nature but also structurally and physical objects um tell us a little bit about the the process um that that can tell kind of affects and, and where the challenge was and what really inspired you to create a solution to you know help builders uh, create a space and environments um, you know, efficiently, effectively, and, and, you know, really enable the success of, of, you know, uh, building a project. Yeah. Um, that's actually a really great question. So like I just explained, there's so much that goes into creating a project from start to finish from involving like the architecture team yeah. to really mapping out what pre-construction looks like to actually getting in and building that structure 
and then even having to maintain it after that point and manage it. There's just so many different trades involved, people with specialty uh, knowledge of different aspects of that project. And then you've got people that are having to handle and project manage all of that simultaneously with different things going on. You've got weather delays happening. There's just so many things going on. It's a very exciting thing to be involved in, which is why I find the industry just so fascinating and interesting. It's just no two projects are ever the same. No two situations are ever the same. The site's different. The building's different. Yeah. The team is different. Um, and so we actually noticed, my co-founder and I, when we were building out Kintail, um, that a lot of the data that was coming in for these projects, they're really producing this mass amount of information that, as you can imagine, um, trying to coordinate multiple teams of people, multiple materials, just all the things going on, like what a nightmare that could possibly be trying to get all of that working in sync with one another, keep a project on time, on budget. So that way, at the end of the day, you know, your company still needs to be profitable. You need to be able to supply jobs to the team members that you work with and really have everybody working like in concert with one another. Um, and so we actually saw when construction, very notorious for being sort of a technical like laggard in the industries, you know, it's, it's, it's been behind, but they've been yeah. like getting much, much better about that in just the last couple of years. They've really started getting into technology adoption. You know, they've got drones on projects now. You've got some VR technology. You've got big yeah. modeling. Um, so much of that that's happening. And it's great because it's really made so many things that they do so much more efficient, productive, profitable in a lot of ways. But what's happened at the same time is that in the adoption of that, it's created kind of a problem. And one that I don't think a lot of people foresaw coming, but Carson and I did um, just a few years ago. So what starts happening is when you start getting a lot of technology in places, um, it's great because it's automating processes and making things more efficient. Right. But it's also doing two things. One, it's creating a lot of important data, very vital, critical information that you might not have previously had because now that you've got technology, it's now creating like a digital footprint. So you're being able to like go in and assess what does that mean for my company um, in things and situations and scenarios that you couldn't previously look at, which is awesome because it's creating all kinds of valuable information to really dig into. Problem is, is that so much of the technology that they utilize um, is very legacy. So a lot of things don't connect to one another. Um, this is an industry that unlike many others that we see today and are very familiar with in what we do, um, even as what you might have, Julian, is just that you've got the ability to connect and integrate a bunch of different applications. You know, you're sharing data all over the place. But in construction, they don't have that ability. Um, and so for them, like over 80% of their software doesn't integrate. Um, it's very legacy. They, they don't have APIs to easily connect things. And then on top of that, you're talking about construction managers that just trying to pull out data out of systems like that spend about 1,300 hours annually just trying to assemble that data into some yeah. kind of usable state so you can get insights out of that. And so that really for us was something we saw coming a couple of years ago. And so we had started building and working on this platform um, before 2021, which is when we were founded was last year, um, and really started looking at how could we help companies be able to coordinate this type of information so that we can extract all of this valuable information that they're creating on a daily basis and be able yeah. to put that into a way that we're all familiar with in other industries of being able to gain that data-driven type of decision, those insights. And so that's really what we do and what we formulated is a platform that helps with that. So that way, anybody in an organization can get the insights they need and they can do all of that without having to hire a data engineer, without having to hire a data scientist and really get all of that done in minutes, which is um, pretty crazy and pretty awesome at the same time. It, it's incredible. The ability for technology to really um, decrease the amount of impact uh, like data has on a project or even just tracking the information and communication. Um, 1500 hours is, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people consider how much time that's half of the working hours in a given year. There's like, you know, two, 2000, what, 2080, so 2800, you know, working hours for, you know, if you work a 40 hour work week, some people work more obviously, but you know, that, that's a significant percentage of the amount of time you spend and, and, um, and decreasing that amount of time, I could only imagine the effects that it, that it's had. Um, I, I love what you're doing, especially because it's a, you call it a no code, uh, platform And these, I think nowadays are becoming so popular. We have, you know, there's like bubble.io where you can build, you know, 
web platforms and, and mobile platforms, we use um, Airtable to create kind of our own internal, we, we you know, run a recruiting a company for Latin American engineers and we have uh, Airtable to create an ATS and plugs in with Zapier and all these automations that, um, that a and API that are built in that, that really allow, um, you know, businesses like ours to run uh, at, at a different level versus, you know, a few years ago, wouldn't be able to, to be at where it is now. What goes into building, you know, a no code platform? What are, what kind of like the, the product roadmap that you have to consider, um, when you're building something that, you know, whoever your customer base is going to be interacting with has to be simple and has to involve complex technology but offer a very simplistic way to connect those technologies. What goes into the process of building that? Yeah, um, this is um, my favorite part of the discussion just because <laughs> this is what makes Kintail um, just so unique. Um, so we're a two-founder team, so it's myself and actually my husband. We're both the co-founders of the business. Um, and it really, for something like this, take, um, for lack of a better word, a marriage, if you will, <laughs> of different skill sets really having to come together and really like digging into who your user persona is, having an understanding of how that person works with technology, mm -hmm. like what's their level of technicality when it comes to understanding this very technical concept and how do you take what is essentially a very technical concept and like boil it down to something where you can democratize analytics across an organization, understanding that many of the people that would utilize a tool like this do not come from a background of understanding analytics and how to build yeah. metrics and things like that. They're not all like power users of Power BI and things like that. So you really got to like take what I have as a skill set for design, understanding how to like work with minimal design, how to like take things that are very complex concepts and make them very easy to use. And then take what's a very complicated back end and be able to do it in a robust way to where you're handling like a lot of different data, a lot of volume of that, and be able to run it through seamlessly to where our data is instantly available um, to that end user. So for us, really, it is trying to, if you're in any company is trying to build a product like this, it's really having to sit down and take it down to its most basic concepts. And whenever that's like that high level concept, you're really having to like walk it back to where you've got that really non-technical beginner level understanding and then trying to make the design just something that's super easy, super simplistic yeah. and don't make anything that's too complex to where you've got this very like long-winded um, time that you're spending in an app just because you're a user in a lot of cases. This is not yeah. where they live. So for like a construction um, manager, this is not like their day-to-day -day tool. They've yeah. got things that they're using to do their job. This is really something more to get them that information that they need that's locked up in those tools and being able to see like, how is my project progressing? Like, how well are we performing? You know, like, what does my team look like today? Um, and so we really need to do something in a way that gets them that information as fast as possible. So you got to like really bring in those design concepts to be able to achieve that and achieve it flawlessly. Yeah. Yeah, and what goes through, you know, I, I've heard this a lot from, you know, people who are building product and, and creating a simplistic view. How, what is the type of questions you're asking or the feedback? How are you receiving that feedback to really know the, you know, the effectiveness of that product? Is it, you know, often um, kind of like touching base with your client? A, a lot of times it, going through a very involved onboarding process and user experience. I'm always curious on how they're developing, you know, um, in, in that way that, you know, boils it down. Because I think we all understand what the concept means, but the mechanics, I think, are a little bit, um, you know, obscure to those who don't come from, uh, you know, a design background, but I'm, I'm curious on, on what's the process and the mechanics behind getting to that level. Yeah, that's actually a really great question. And I would say a lot of that does come from the customer onboarding, customer experience, spending a lot of time with your end user. Um, and so often it is said repeatedly in technology. Too often teams and companies build things that people don't want. And yep. the reason for that is, is that you don't spend enough time building maybe more of the back end of a product to understand how the technology works before you start really getting into that end state of what that platform will be, which usually tends to be the UI UX. So you really got to one, understand if what you're building can be done. Is that technology capable of achieving what it says it can? And then once you have that in place, really sitting down with your customer and asking them, 
you know, what's your level of technical knowledge on this subject? What is something that would get you the results that you're looking for, but in the fastest time possible? How do we make it to where we're improving your workday, improving your workflow, um, automating all of that information, but doing it in a way that's really meaningful for what you're trying to achieve out of that? Because, you know, from our perspective, running a construction tech company, you know, we're very different than the end user themselves. So we have two very different concepts of what technology might mean to someone. So really taking the time to understand like where they're coming from, how they use technology, how they view software even, especially if you're talking about working in a very legacy industry. Um, you're talking about people that don't often think as technology as the first solution to something. Um, a lot of times it's more manual or gut-based decision-making that's involved in trying to put these things together. Um, so especially in that regard, you got to like take that into account and be very empathetic to how they approach um, tools in, yeah. in their day. Um, and so really using that to your advantage, I think is one of the biggest things you can do to really be able to be successful in building out a really strong UI UX that resonates with that particular end user. Yeah, no, it makes so much sense the way you broke it down. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm so curious about the traction now that you're facing, you've, you've built this really um, really simplistic product to, to um, you know, affect an industry in, in so many ways and, and creates such a um, unified kind of experience for you know, builders. And I'm, I'm assuming so many different stakeholders that um, uh, go into this technology. Um, what's the traction you're seeing? How many customers do you have right now? Who, who are you excited that you're working with? Um, what's the growth look like right now? Um, and what are you kind of, what's your expectation for not only the end of the year, but you know, the next, um, the next couple months and quarters and things like that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so we actually, we were founded last year, but we spent all of our time last year in accelerators. Um, I was the only person working full-time at the company um, at that time. So my co-founder was still working full-time at another construction tech startup um, yeah. in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where we're from originally. Um, and so once we um, came up here to Indianapolis, we moved here after attending Techstars, um, that cohort this past fall. Um, we really only just had gone into market earlier this year. Um, and so over the last about six to eight months, we've gone into market. We've already signed multiple large enterprise construction firms to annual subscriptions in about six months time um, wow. and are now scaling up our product for this next year with a second version of our product releasing in June, um, which is pretty awesome. We've probably built out about uh, 14 integrations for what we're doing um, with a two person team is, is to me pretty impressive um, use of our time and work. Um, and already had customers excited about what we were doing before the initial um, first version of the product was even available. Um, so really now at this point, it is just struggling to keep up with customer demand and just trying to figure out how we juggle all of that, which is a good problem to have, um, but still something you're having to work out and try to assess what you do with that as a startup founder. Yeah, no, extremely impressive the, the level of growth and um, you know, adoption of your platform. And it sounds like people are more and more seeing the value of, of you know, implementing something like, like your platform. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a great problem to have is, is staying up with customer demand. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that Kintel faces today? That's such a great, and that's exactly the problem that we're having today is that's really our biggest risk is you know. struggling with having two co-founders and that being our whole and only team is the two of us trying to juggle multiple customers that have, you know, a lot of different things that they want to see connected in terms of their data, being able to expand the product further, add new features, you know, keep up with onboarding and all of that has become probably our biggest risk is just being able to juggle all those different roles. There's just so many different things that just between the two of you that like one minute you're working on sales, the next minute you're marketing, next minute it's product development, next minute it's onboarding a customer. It's just like every day it's all up and down and it just feels risky just because you're like, at, at the end of the day, there's only so many hours you have to give as a founder and just trying to like weigh which thing was the most important to work on that day versus that week versus that month. Like what's the next six months ahead? Like just trying to keep your head above water um, really for us has been the challenge. Um, but the great thing is, is that we're actually currently fundraising to help in that regard and have really big plans going into 2023 for hiring or go to market or product development. So a lot of like great fun things on the horizon that, um, I think will really help mitigate that risk for us going forward. I think, yeah, 
people and, and I'm so excited to, to see what, what comes of it. And, um, yeah, I, I love the founder experience. I mean, that it's like, you don't do one thing you do probably 10 to 20 things in, in a given day, um, out of, out of necessity, but also I'm, I'm sure out of excitement, enthusiasm to what you're building as well. If everything goes well, what's the long-term vision for Kintail? Um, so really our biggest goal is to become the industry standard for data analytics. Um, I, I just find this whole industry just very fascinating. It's very near and dear to our hearts. And so to be able to go in and be that industry standard and really help, um, pave the way, uh, for what companies are looking to do in the near future, you've got, would say at least 30 to 40% of that workforce is about to be retiring in the next five years. Um, which is a big challenge. And that's what's putting a lot of strain on that labor shortage that they're facing. So really that adoption of technology has been like a big factor on why they're pushing forward with that is you've got to get more of like the millennial age group, Gen Z, you know, top of millennial age group is about 40 now at this point. So you really got like so much more of that with people that grew up with technology to kind of expect that in a job um, and find, you know, that to be fast names to work with. So really for us, like, being able to be at that great stage where we're at that millennial age group. So we're like that exact group that they're trying to target with getting more people interested in construction. And I think just being able to be a part of that, where that big change is happening to where you see them adopting this technology, they're bringing in analytics, they're getting insights into their business. They're really being able to ramp up so much of what we saw as a struggle for like manufacturing um, was kind of an issue for even insure tech. Um, with healthcare, like that was what was happening to them just a few years ago. And we see where they are today. I mean, it's such a huge change in those industries, that's based on like productivity and efficiency alone by being able to adopt that and getting insight, like just such a massive positive yeah. change for them that like really that test is like super exciting that we're getting in where we are now today, like the best time that we could be starting this. Um, and really just getting to be that, that industry leader is what we're really getting for there. I think that's, and that's so exciting. And, and yeah, you mentioned healthcare. I was talking to another founder and he created pretty much a, a way for just overall practitioners to communicate better, um, and, and keep track of information on, on patients. And I can only imagine kind of using that philosophy and creating kind of a more efficient process, a, a one that allows more communication, visibility. Um, it's, but it, it's interesting. You, you think about those who are coming into these current, the, the older spaces that have been you know, uh, around since the dawn of time, you know, construction has been around since we started, we started building things and making fires and, and things along that nature. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the process behind it, I think is, is, um, so fascinating and the adoption of technology with, with people of these age groups, because, um, yeah, there, I feel like you're right. There's a certain expectation you have, um, yeah. going into it about, you know, e- even just having some visibility and accountability and technology kind of allows yeah. that without you know, without kind of old procedures that, um, that we're comfortable. Um, I know we're coming to a close and, and I would like to ask this question selfishly for my own research, but also for my audience, um, whether it was throughout your career or currently now, what books or people have influenced you the most? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to shamelessly plug him, but Kyle Lacey, um, he is just like a behemoth in the marketing space. Um, he was previously with Lessonly, and then when Lessonly was acquired, um, then Seismic. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting him recently here in Indy. Um, and I told him that out of all the people that were there on the evening that we met, that he was the one I was most nervous to meet just because he has just such a great understanding yes. of branding, of marketing, just really being able to read the personality of a company into what you put out there um, into the world. And I just was so thrilled to meet him. He just has lessonly as a company. um, They are another indie-based startup that was just recently acquired. Um, I've just always admired just the ability to take what a company um, stands for, its mission, its purpose, its team, and be able to reflect that back into your branding, into your marketing, and be able to create this entire world around what you do that um, just really envelops people in a way that gets them inspired and very motivated to work with you just because it's like fun. You create like a really interesting, unique atmosphere that for like company culture, like that's huge. Right. Um, and so he's just one of those people that I have always like had an interest in meeting 
um, and was absolutely thrilled that he loved our branding, that he really loved our pitch and our story, which was fantastic. And so that, that was just really inspiring to me and, and really great to get to meet him. That's incredible. I, it, it's always amazing in terms of marketing, how to create kind of an ecosystem around, um, and an experience around what you're building. Obviously, you know, you, you could boil it down to a problem and a solution, but you know, people are really entrenched in the stories behind, you know, your product and, yeah. and your experience. Um, it was so amazing speaking with you and I'm so excited to see what comes of Kin, uh, Kintail as, as you continue to build and raise, raise money and, and disrupt the industry. Um, last little bit before we end, I always like to ask my founders, where can we be a part of the story? The, where can we support you? Give us your LinkedIn's, your, your Twitter's, your websites. Where can we be a fan and, and a supporter and maybe even a customer of Kintail? Yeah, it's uh, kintail.io um, is our website link. So feel free to join us there and sign up to follow alongside us as we build this journey and really excited to have everybody along for the ride. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Mel, for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed yourself and, and um, I'm really excited to spread the message and, and what you're doing. And again, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Love coming on Behind Company Lines and thrilled to have been here with you today, Julian. Awesome.